Well, we have a treat for you today. We're going to be hearing uh, in a minute from my father, Daniel Brown, who is the founding pastor of this church, if you, if you didn't know that. Um, he and my mom planted this church, which is, uh, speaking of jargon, Christian jargon for starting a church. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited to hear from him. Uh, but I wanted to spend a couple of minutes just mentioning what it is that he does now, because you might not see a ton of him around, uh, because he's traveling the world, literally. He went to Uganda. Do you, you remember that thing when, when we were younger, where it's like, oh man, I'm nervous to say yes to God, because he might send me to Africa, you know, to, to be a missionary, and we're like, no, that probably won't happen. Well, that happened to him. I mean, it's, he literally went to Africa. Um, and, and did some discipleship seminars there. It's pretty, pretty incredible. But um, L- Lindsay and I are so grateful to you, my mom and my dad for the family legacy that we have. And I regularly think about this place that I get to be in, a place of blessing because of the things that my parents did for us just as our parents. But it occurs to me that our church also is in kind of a similar spot, that we get to, we're, we're living in a place of blessing in, in many ways because of the faithfulness that my dad and my mom exhibited at, uh, at, in starting this church and, and leading it. And uh, he's someone that I talk to a lot about, like, okay, help me think about this, dad, or what do you think about this? And so he still continues to kind of indirectly uh, help our church. But I was thinking about that word legacy. And it made me smile earlier thinking like, in God, we all have an opportunity to have an awesome legacy. And it's, it's not like fantastical or unrealistic to imagine that there could be a group of people who, you know, 20 years, 30, I don't know how, 70 years, and I forget how old you are, Dad, but <laughs> so many years from now, some group of people sitting around saying, wow, isn't it so awesome that we are blessed because of the people, you perhaps, who were faithful in God doing what you did and leaving a legacy for generations. We all get that opportunity. Um, So I want to leave, leave you with that thought, but would you welcome my dad up here as he shares with us this morning? Thank you, Evan. Thank you. Okay, just for the record, I'm 66 a couple of days ago, and I think all of my children but you sent me a text. (laughs) That's not actually true. Not all of them did, but uh, yeah. Okay, interesting that you would mention legacy because I've concluded uh, that I don't believe in legacy. At least not what many people mean by it. And maybe the best way to explain what, I, what I'm saying, I wrote an article some time ago, and the title of the article was Third from the Left. And in the back of my mind, I had this picture of a, some young guy uh, coming up to look at an old photo that was on the wall of somebody's graduation. And there's three rows of all these people and just the first initial and last name of all the people, and D. Brown was third from the left. And so this uh, this young guy's looking at this photo. Why? I don't know. It's obvious they're really from long ago, Uh, not a hologram at that point. It's just some old (laughs) picture, right? And the guy's looking. He sees my face, D. Brown, third from the left. And then the person that's holding the elevator for him says, hey, buddy, are you coming or not? And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes and gets in the elevator after thinking to himself, I wonder what that guy was like. Gets in the elevator, goes, and never has a thought about D. Brown, third from the left, ever again. And I believe that the greatest that you can aspire to ever is just third from the left and that the only real opportunity that you and I have to make a difference is in the lives of our classmates 
because the thought that somebody in the future is going to have some thought about you, not going to happen. Now, the spiritual legacy is another story, and the only spiritual legacy that you and I have is when our life has impacted another's life, and that life then impacts somebody else. But nobody will have a generational memory beyond maybe two generations. So whether or not my life counts for something or makes a difference is really just the investment that I make in my classmates now, not anything that I'm going to ultimately leave behind. So I'm glad I've impacted your life. Your mother and I have impacted your life. That's good. You're impacting others, and there we go. Now, speaking of the world, just uh, last Saturday evening, we had a guest uh, here at, uh, at, in Santa Cruz, a man named uh, and his wife, Sam and Sarah On. And they are from South Korea. And what most of my friends wouldn't know is that they are, in terms of Foursquare, our denominational family, they are the key players in that nation. Their church is massive. And their church's budget actually funds the national office of Foursquare in South Korea and supports a good many of the churches. So if you were to go to South Korea and mention them, it would be like, oh, you know, because they all bow. If you, even for you, they would bow, but they really go down. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, Sam was chatting with, uh, with some of us, and he was telling the story, how was it that, that, that Sam and I ended up with this relationship? And what he said was, it was at a breakfast maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago, and he was attending. It was sort of a formal affair, and it was in the U.S. He didn't know so many people, so he was a little bit nervous, he, you know, and he went to this breakfast because he had to go, but he didn't know anybody and didn't really know how it was going to go, so obviously there's an empty chair next to him. And I walk in the room, and I've trained myself to look for the people that I know the least well, and I make a beeline for them. So if I pass you up, by the way, it just means that I know you. Okay. <laughs> it's like, whatever, whatever, whatever. But I'm looking for somebody I didn't know, and I didn't know him. I knew a lot of the other people in the room. So I went and sat next to him and just started a conversation, and that led to this pretty amazing connection off over there. And so I guess my thought about spiritual legacy, it's not really made up of grand ideas. It's just made up of simple decisions that I make that instead of being comfortable myself, I'm going to find someone that I could do something for and plop myself down uh, right there. So yes, I was in Uganda, but I was also in the Netherlands and in the same trip. And that was like weird packing because <laughs> <laughs> boiling hot and freezing cold. But somehow I managed, uh, managed to do it. And I'm very grateful. My good buddy Dick Starr and I do get to travel a lot of places in the world. So I want to share with you this morning as was my pattern many years ago when I was the pastor here at Coastlands, whenever I would go out into the, the world, I wanted to share the latest things that I'd been teaching at my own con to my own congregation with people out there. And if God prompted me with thoughts out there, I wanted to bring them back and share here. It was kind of a way that I kept myself uh, sane. And so there is a, a passage of scripture that's really been on my heart in the last little bit as I've been traveling. And I'm going to invite you to open there. It's in John chapter 21. John chapter 21. The, uh, the verses that we're going to read in a, in a moment, it starts in verse 12 of this chapter. I want to read verse 11 to you because I gave my... <laughs> I gave Vicki the wrong number, and I only told you from verse 12 on. I'm going to read verse 11, and then we're going to read this story, this passage, and then I want to come back and share what happened before this passage 
to try to answer one of the most intriguing questions of the New Testament. How do we know there were 153 fish in the net? And that is found in verse 11. So I didn't remember my glasses, and I think I can do this. So if I'm shifting eyes, uh, there we go. So verse 11, John 21, and then we'll pick it up and keep reading. So Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Oh, you put it up there. Wow. That's like amazing. Okay, we're going to keep reading. And it's easier for me to read if I look up there rather than down here. But I do have my Bible. I just want you to know that, okay? I just don't have my glasses. So if you're going to forget something, forget your glasses rather than your Bible. Here we go. So the next verse. And so Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Simon said to him, yes, Lord, you, you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. And Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because Jesus had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Truly I say to you that when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. Now, when you read the Gospels, just a little heads up for your own Bible study, two things that you want to pay attention to that most people don't. The first is the details. That's why I'm going to come back to 153 fish. Because very often the the, uh, the vital truth contained in a gospel passage is found in the details. They kind of point you in a direction. And the other thing you always want to remember when you're studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John uh, is what we call the context. In other words, what has happened just before and many times what happens right after whatever passage we're looking at. So I'm going to start with the context of what what has happened prior to this episode, the third and basically the final time that Christ is going to appear to his disciples. So since it's the third time, we get it, right, that he has appeared two previous times to this. And some people make a significant uh, issue over the fact that this is the third time that Christ appeared to Peter, and Peter had denied Christ three times before. And even though Peter said, no way, I am never, ever going to deny you. I don't care what those people do. I'm never going to do it. And I have a theory about the 153 fish that's tied in with that denial. But anyway, uh, these poor disciples are very much like us. 
And one of the great things about reading your Bible regularly, 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 not so much when you need an answer to something or when you need direction, you take a dart and throw it at the Bible, whatever verse it sticks in, you take that as your counsel for the next day. No, no, no. But reading your Bible over and over and over, it begins to give you an understanding about the ways of God and it makes sense out of some of the things that maybe in your past you didn't even understand exactly what was going on. And the more you read your Bible, you get a sense of, oh, okay, I get it now. And it's one of the very few things that's good about being old. I'm making a list, and it's very short so far. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Medicare is one of them. Uh, another is you can say a really, 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 really long time ago, and it doesn't matter how many reallys you throw in, people are like with you. They believe you. They believe you. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then you fulfill scriptures without doing anything, like the verse that says, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Okay, I get it. I've played both parts of that, uh, of that, of that drama. But one of the good things about being older and having all the scripture, you know, inside of you, it clarifies things that have happened in your life. And this passage, how it really uh, came alive to me, was the realization that I had made a decision way back in 1970. And that decision was playing out through my whole life and a little choice that I made explains a great deal of the bounty and the blessing and the good that I'm experiencing uh, today. But anyway, when, when I'm reading this story, I'm, it begins with uh, Peter not knowing what to do. And it specifically says, you can check this out, verse 2 or 3 around there, without my glasses, it's just right-hand page, okay? <laughs> so there's seven of the disciples seven of the 11 who remain, and uh, they're just kind of sitting around and they don't know what to do. And I love that picture because you have to have a heart for these guys. They had been used to following Jesus every single day for over three years. They didn't know where they were going. They just knew who they were following. And so they never had to wake up in the morning saying, I wonder what we'll do today. They just followed. They didn't have to pray, oh God, show me your will for my life because he was right there. They just followed along. And as fantastic as it is that Christ has raised from the dead, I mean, glory, hallelujah, amen. For these guys, it just meant that the man who used to lead them everywhere is not there every day. And so it's in between the episodes when Christ appears to them miraculously, kind of like you and I have to live our Christian life. There's a long stretch in between the times when the Lord just gives us such clarity about what we're supposed to do. And most of the other time, it's, it's kind of like this. Well, sure enough, Peter says, uh, I'm going fishing. And the other six jokers say, okay, me too. <laughs> and I realize, huh, little choices that I make about I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that very often will lead other people to do the thing that I'm doing. And even though for me or for you, it might just be an idle decision. It might just be something, oh, well, nobody cares. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do. So rather than thinking about the people that I'm with, I just decide what I'm going to do. But in the kingdom, I really think, as you have walked with the Lord, the decisions that we make uh, automatically get people following us. So they go out and go fishing. And in those days, they fished all night long. Apparently it wasn't a very good idea or wasn't very good fishing or something because they catch nothing all night long. So this is pretty depressing, right, for poor Peter anyway. And I think Peter is still agitated about his denial. My theory, which I cannot prove from Scripture, but mm -mm, you cannot disprove from Scripture. <laughs> 
and I'm holding the mic, so we'll let my theory at least out there on the table. My theory is that Peter hasn't had a one-on-one -on -one time with Christ to kind of resolve the fact that he had really, really blown it. And that reminds me of me. See, the, the Bible is a mirror, and I'm always looking for where am I in this story. Because the two previous times when Christ has appeared to the disciples, there's a whole group of them, and I don't think Peter has found the opportunity to draw Jesus aside and say, you know, about that rooster and, you know, all of that stuff, I'm really, really sorry and I want you to know it happened once, but it is never going to happen again. I've learned my lesson, Lord. And though I failed you there, though I denied you, though I lived in a way that I promised I never would, having blown it once, I'm really ready to be your man from this point on. It will never, ever happen again. He hasn't had a chance to make it up to Christ for what he has done. Well, they're out there, been fishing. They get nothing. And early, early in the morning, it's still kind of dark. They can't really see who it is at the lake shore. But somebody cries out and says, hey, have you caught any fish? Now, as a fisherman, I can tell you, if you have caught a lot of fish, that's the most welcome question <laughs> in the world because you can say, oh, yeah, we caught tons of them. But if you haven't caught any fish, that is the last question that you want to hear from anybody. Hey, have you caught any fish? You don't want to have to cry out across the lake. No! <laughs> but it's pretty obvious they've caught nothing. So this man says, well, try the other side of the boat. Now we will learn a detail, if you go back and read on your own, uh, it's a very small boat. That word is mentioned, a small boat. Now, casting your net on this side of a small boat or on that side, we're only dealing with a few feet difference. So whatever, these guys are so desperate. They've caught nothing, and so, well, why not? And they lower their nets, and sure enough, the Bible says they end up with a, a huge catch of fish. And finally, John says, hey, 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 it's the Lord. And Peter, I think, looks up. And the Bible says he leaps into the lake. Maybe he's thinking he walked on water once. <laughs> you know, maybe it'll work again. But how, whether he jumped in feet first or dove in, it, he doesn't walk on water. He swims like a crazy man to get to shore. And the rest of the disciples in the small boat row to the shore, and Peter doesn't get there very much before everybody else shows up. What made him so eager to jump in the water and get to Christ? And that's where my theory comes to play. I think he wants a few moments alone with the Lord to say, I'm really sorry. So picture this then in your mind. Peter is swimming up. He's dripping wet. He gets out of the water and doesn't have a chance to say anything because these guys rode so fast and they're all there with this huge catch of fish. <laughs> And they see a barbecue. And there's fish already on the barbecue. There is even bread cooking on the barbecue. <laughs> and Jesus says, you can bring the fish that you caught. Now, two observations. The first is the quote, quote, fish that they quote, 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 caught are fish that they only caught because Christ basically did everything but haul in the net. <laughs> it's not as though they really, oh, had some fish and Jesus didn't need the fish. There's already fish on the barbecue. 
but I think it is his kindness and his mercy, not wanting to let these guys feel left out. He says, well, you can bring some of your fish also. Now, there's no room on the barbecue. We'll be totally full by the time we eat what I provide, but I want you to feel included. And Peter brings him a hundred and 53 fish. Now, why did it go from a large catch of fish to 153? And I think it's because Peter, like me, and like you, is always trying to make up for what we've done wrong. And as soon as Jesus says, you can bring your fish, I think Peter's thinking, okay, okay, you want fish? You want fish? I'll get you fish. And so he goes to these flopping fish, and he's getting them off the beach, and he's counting them 151, 152, 153, and if you want more fish, I'll get you more fish. Is it enough? I'm so sorry. You say you want fish, I'll give you fish. Just forgive me for what I've done. How like us. We get a sense that Jesus wants something and we're even prepared to offer him our time. And think of it, the only reason you have time is because he gave you life. Our money, oh, I'll give you more money. What? The scripture says he's the one that even gives us the ability to make money. You want to bring your talents? Okay, okay. But he's the one that gave you talents. He doesn't really need the fish that we want to give him. Because we think maybe, maybe, if you want, Lord, I'll So the barbecue is cooking, and they have breakfast. I love this. Nobody says a thing. So that means they're, I mean, I'm sure he is the Christ, but I still kind of want to ask him. Nobody says anything. They just, <laughs> and they're waiting for some idiot to be the first one to break the silence. But nobody does. So you have to picture this. <laughs> They've calmed down. There's fish on the barbecue. There's bread on the barbecue. Now dead silence for a number of minutes. And then Jesus says to Peter, Do you love me? That's the thing that Peter wanted to make up the Lord. I, I, I don't want you to have to ask me, especially not in front of all of my friends. <laughs> Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, yes, 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 I do. Yes, I do. Tend my sheep. Okay. Sheep, fish, whatever you want, I'll get them for you. And he asks him a second time, do you, do you love me? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. And Jesus once again gives him instruction. I want you to invest your life in taking care of others. And what I love about this passage, it reminds me actually of a, a teaching series that my wife did many Years, many, 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 no, no, that's me. <laughs> Should never say that about your wife, right? Okay. I'll just say some time ago, it was something of what I want for my children. And she has kind of four things that she wants for her kids. And the, the essence of it is, she says, you know, I don't need any more guilt as a mother. So these are not four things like on a tick list that, because as soon as you don't do them, then you feel like a total failure. So she said, think of them as directions that you can keep walking so that even if today you trip and fall or if today you don't have any energy to actually walk, no worries, because you can always head north. 
And so she offers to moms, and it's actually pretty good for dads as well, four directions that she wanted to always be going. And I think of this as the same kind of a principle. Jesus said, I want you to orient your life, and I'm asking you, do you love me? And the right answer is not, yes, Lord, I pay my tithe. Yes, Lord, I volunteer at the office. Yes, Lord, I, yes, Lord, I do all of these things that Christ can already do. He says, if you love me, I want you to make it your focus to take care of other people. And then he asks him a third time. And I think this just really got to Peter because his answer is a little different. He says, but Lord, you, you, you know all things. You know everything. And if you're asking me, do I love you, and you know the answer to the question, I thought I did, maybe I don't. I think he's thinking back to the failure, his denial from long ago. And he's not remembering that Jesus knew he was going to deny him. Jesus had told Peter ahead of time, you are going to fail me. But don't worry, I have prayed, and after you get turned around, after you get recovered from the mistake that you make, which I am prophesying to you, you are going to make, after you get turned around, do you remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, I want you to take this experience and what you've learned when you are reoriented, and I want you to strengthen and secure your brethren. You see, the calling of the Christian life is not me, it's not a Lone Ranger, by the way, it's not a Bible character. <laughs> we, we have unintentionally uh, fallen into a misperception about the kingdom that it is primarily about me getting to heaven and having my problems taken care of along the way. I mean, good for you that you're going, amen. But the life that Christ calls his followers to is to be thinking about other people more than I'm thinking about myself. So when he says, do you love me a third time? And Peter says, but you know everything. I can't believe you're asking me again. Yes, 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 yes. Jesus gives him the same answer. Now, I believe, and kind of how this whole passage came alive to me, I don't believe that Jesus was testing Peter. <clears throat> okay, Pete, let's see if you had the right answer. Do you love me? Yes. I don't think he was testing him. I think he was offering Peter a far more secure, a far more fulfilling way of life than always trying to make it up with the Lord. We're okay now, right? Are we? Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, Lord, we're okay now? I'm so sorry. I'll give you more of this. I'll give you more of that. Lord, I want you to know I love Because you and I, no matter how many times we tell Christ, whew, okay. I was young, now I'm old, so temptation is past me. Don't worry, Lord, I got this one. No matter how many times we tell God we're not going to blow it and that we really, 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 really have learned our lesson, if you'll just forgive us one more time, that way doesn't ever get secure. If I have this kind of transactional relationship with God and I'm trying to convince him I'm fine or I'm feeling bad and so I make it up to him. That isn't what Jesus wants for us. So rather than him saying to Peter, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about how you really blew it. Are we past that now? Jesus gives him a secure way to live. My ups and downs my lefts and rights, the 
bad choices, the so-so choices, and the once in a while good choices that I make. That's just too rocky of a life. And what will give you staying power? What will, what will secure you, I guess is what I'm trying to say, more than anything else, is a decision to express my love for God in my care for others. And because I'm so grateful that he has freed me from things, I then can offer freedom to other people. And since I have experienced his mercy, oh God, his mercy, then I can extend to others his mercy. And I really believe this is what the incarnational Christian life is all about. Oh, I have a checkered past. Oh, I have made mistakes. Oh, but, you know, I haven't just made mistakes. I've actually done some pretty good things. And I can, in caring for other people, draw on the Word of God, draw on the Spirit of God, draw on His work and dealings in my life. And when the focus of my energies, when the focus of my attention is on other people, it really smooths over the inevitable ups and downs. So I don't believe that Jesus was testing Peter. I think he was alerting him. And that decision that I made way back in 1970, I had no idea what I was doing. I, uh, yeah, my son is smiling at me, 1970, Dad, I, sheesh, I don't even think they have that in museums. It was like, you know, <laughs> prehistoric, but, well, when I was young, it was a long time ago. I, I know that. I kind of had a radical reconversion to Christ, or how I would put it, my, the, the Jesus of my boyhood became the Jesus of my young adulthood. Not that Jesus changed, you know, but I don't know how to say it. I changed in relation to him. It was really radical. It was on the heels of knowing, for me at least, <laughs> I really, really had done wrong. If I were, yeah, maybe for you wouldn't, I don't know. But for me, I just was really, really, really convicted. And I cried out in such a, 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 a broken place like Peter. Kind of like, Lord, can you ever forgive me? And gave my life back to him and started going his way. But I don't know how, I don't have the right language. But, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm always doing something with my hand, hoping that I can do some linguistic magic and do this. Oh, there's the word. I, I, it, it's, but it's not working. I guess somehow what I understood was that saying yes to Christ and stepping into this adult and more mature relationship with him was part and parcel with other people and doing things for other people. It was just maybe a weeks later that I started doing my first Bible study. Not because I thought, oh my goodness, I have so much to share but really with the understanding, well, I'm a beggar and you're a beggar and so let me show you something that has fed me. And so how this passage came alive to me was the Lord just alerting me and saying, you chose to shepherd my sheep. You chose to tend my lambs. And now you can understand everything that has happened in your life and through your life, not on the basis of anointing or giftedness, but on the basis of a choice. However my life goes, 
on the, in the aftermath of whatever I have done, I will shepherd the sheep of God. And I'm telling you, stuff happens. It's a, it's a corollary to the less I think about me, the happier I am. I mean, I'm a fairly depressing subject. <laughs> the less I think about me and my future and my this and my that, not that it's evil, but it cannot hold a candle to, as Paul said, who is weak in the body without me being weak? Who is dealing with difficulties but that I'm dealing with difficulties? That investment in other people is what Jesus was pointing to. And I believe it's what secured Peter for his whole life. Now, the last few verses can seem depressing. Uh, Jesus saying, I just want you to know how you're going to die. <laughs> okay. When you were young, you got to kind of put on your own clothes, but when you get older, it's not going to happen that way. You're going to be stretched out and you're going you're to die. You're going to be crucified. And we know from church tradition, I don't think we have historical records, but from church tradition, uh, Peter was crucified. But as the story goes, and maybe you've heard this before, when it came time to, to killing him, crucifying him, he said, please, please, could you just do me this favor and crucify me upside down? Because I am not worthy to die in the same way that my Lord died. So flip me upside down and kill me that way. From these somewhat depressing verses, I take two encouraging <laughs> lessons. The first is that maturity, Christian maturity. You were young, you used to get to do this, and now you're going to get older. How I think about and define being, quote, mature or growing up in God it just means I less and less have the freedom to do what I want. Well, I mean, I can always do what I want, but because I'm a mature believer, I don't do just what I want. I do what others need or want. Less freedom for me, more life for others. And it's so counterintuitive. Remember Jesus when he was telling his disciples, hey, who does everybody say that I am? And, you know, they got the wrong answer until finally Peter, the same Peter, said, oh, oh, you're the Christ. And then when Jesus was explaining to Peter and everybody else, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. It's not going to go well there. I'm going to be insulted and crucified. This same Peter said, Lord, that's nuts. No, 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 no. That is not the way to win friends and influence people. <laughs> but Jesus said to this same Peter, mm -mm. you are not thinking the way that God thinks. You are thinking the way that man thinks. And if you want to follow me, you're going to have to learn to contradict or to deny your natural impulses and your natural thinking. And he says, let me give you a for instance. In the kingdom, if you are last, you end up first. In the kingdom, if you wish to rise to a role or to a place, the way that you do that is by coming under and serving other people. And so I know it's hard to kind of wrap our brain around. But I believe the happiest people in the world ultimately are those who follow Christ and who say, not my will, but yours be done. And you understand that his will for me as a child of God is that I will serve his purposes 
and his people. And doing that, oh my goodness, the life that we end up living. And the final kind of observation that I make about this statement, when you were young, you could dress yourself, and then when you get old, you're going to be crucified. <laughs> yeah, following God is really not as clear-cut as some people would like you to believe. Most of the time, we're like Peter and the disciples. I have no idea where the Lord is. I know he's in heaven, he's resurrected, but I really wish he'd come down and just speak to me or send me an email or something like that. And very rarely do we get it. Hmm. So ultimately, when I... <laughs> Sorry. I'm looking at Evan as though he can help me, but he has no idea where I'm going. Okay, it's going to sound depressing when I first say it, but stick with me because I want to say two things at the same time, but I cannot. I can only say them one at a time. When you place yourself in the hands of God, I mean, when you really, really, really let go and say, Lord, my life is not my own. Here I am, oh God, here I am. I am yours. When you place yourself in the hands of God, you end up in the hands of people. And those people will take you places you don't want to go. And those people will do things to you you don't want to have done. Because I am in the hands of God, because he is sovereign and rules over all, that letting go ultimately enables him to use my life and my death to glorify him. If I am not relinquished, he gets no glory when you die. And you are going to die. You are going to have trouble. Your life is not going to be easy. When I was young, I used to think there were some people who ended up happy. <laughs> now that I'm old, I hate to tell you young people, don't believe it. <laughs> Nobody's life goes the way they wanted it to go. And no one escapes stuff. So I don't think that Jesus was saying, I just want you to know ahead of time, you're going to die on a cross. Do you still love me now? That doesn't sound like the Jesus I know. I think Jesus was saying, listen, as you get older, <laughs> other people are going to have thoughts for your life. If nothing else, your grandkids will. <laughs> but if you feed my sheep, if you tend to my lambs, then being dragged about and moved about in ways that were not your first choice will end up being profoundly, profoundly fulfilling. In Closing, I want to just tell you, well, this jumped out at me. I think Dick and I were in Colombia, in, in a town called Barranquilla. I'd never even heard of Barranquilla. 
And I realize these last 15 years, as I've just, you know, done whatever God has asked me to do, no longer pastoring, just out and about, well, never, ever did I want to go to Badenkia. If you're from there, please forgive me. But it wasn't like on my bucket list, the top 10 things I want. I want to go to Badenkia. In fact, I was reviewing some photos from these last years. I don't even remember these cities, the names. How did I get here? Because in 1970, I said, okay. I said, yes, I will serve others. And I have ended up places I did not want to go <laughs> at all and places that it never occurred to me to end up going. And I serve him. I serve his purposes. And that calling and opportunity is available to us all. Let's say yes, oh God. Yes, I love you. And hear him say, take care of others. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you... <laughs> Oh, you are so good and so wise. And the silly things that I have said that maybe all of us have said, oh, I don't want a pith helmet on my head. I don't want to end up in some far off. And now having been to Uganda twice and fallen in love with some of those people, Lord, thank you that you have a plan for us that is so much better than the puny little thoughts that we have about what we want and what we don't want. And I ask, O oh Lord, that you would settle into every single person who hears these words, settle in them the conviction that, yes, when I put my life in your hands, O oh God, I know that I end up in the hands of others. And where they would want to move me and take me wouldn't always be my first choice. But Lord, you have determined that my life will bring you glory. And so I surrender afresh to you. I surrender afresh to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Evan? Thank you, Dad. It was really, isn't it so great to be reminded how kind God is? I don't know, I, I could hear about that all day, every day, how kind he is towards us, even when, like Peter, we, we blow it. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Dad. It was really great hearing about that essential decision in 1870 that you made to follow the Lord. <laughs> um, it's really incredible. Just one, one piece of advice for, for all of you as you hear a message like this. Um, I wonder if there's a name of someone, you know, someone popped into your head as you're hearing about God offering us a life being lived for others. I just wonder if there's a name or names that just kind of floated in your mind as you were hearing that. If that's the case, then that would be the spirit putting someone on your heart. So you have direction beyond just a general principle. And I just want to encourage you to, to follow that. All right? Well, everybody, good to be with you here this morning. God bless you. Stay cool. I didn't think I was going to say that ever again, but it's going to warm up today. And uh, can't wait to get VBS rolling. Love you. Bye-bye.